Well, greetings, everyone. Uh, happy Sabbath to you all. Uh, today we have another go to meeting two session. We enjoy the company of many around the world. Tonight we're going to hear from one of our elders in Indianapolis. The title of his message today is Woman at the Well. Woman at the Well. Here I introduce you to Steve Durham. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning wherever you are. And uh, all around the world, we certainly enjoy having everyone here. Uh, today, I want to talk about the woman at the well. And I kind of subtitled it, Hope Springs Eternal. <laughs> um, there's so many things to, to, to lessons that we can learn from, from this encounter that Christ gives us. Uh, it happened early in his ministry, and he sort of set the stage for how he would deal with the, those in the community and the area around uh, Jerusalem and north and uh, all the way up to Galilee and, and, and Judah. Uh, during the Passover season, as we, we about two weeks away from it, uh, I, want, I wanted to talk about this. I was going to talk about the foot washing, but that's been covered several times. But I want you to think about the attitude of the, uh, that Christ gave us at the end of his ministry about foot washing, service, caring, loving, compassion, and then also what he came to do in his body, in the flesh, and also the, the blood that was spilled for our benefit, uh, for our the redemption of, sin, uh, of, of the, ourselves and our uh, salvation and eternal life. All those things fit in, and we can get lessons from it from the, the woman at the well. So we're going to look at this example today of Jesus and the woman at the well. <clears throat> and I want to also have you take a look at it from a different viewpoint. Uh, if you step back and look at and you, what, what you know about the woman at the well right now, uh, he offers her living water. He offers her eternal life. But there's so, I want to look in, the, in between the lines. I want to look at the nuances, the personalities that were there. And how, what, what Jesus knew about this situation and what she felt and knew and how the two came together and how Jesus handled that. It, it, it's such a wonderful lesson for us today <clears throat> as we learn to love our, our neighbors, love the world, have, show compassion, and follow the example of our, our Savior and our big brother, Jesus Christ, as we deal with the world around us and also as we deal with those in the church. Very important, like we heard last night. Very important. Um, actually, that is where the rubber meets the road. It is uh, in Matthew 22. Loving our neighbor as ourself is predicated, of course, on loving God and Jesus Christ first. We understand it. That's the hard part, isn't it? Learning to love our neighbor. Learning to love the person we can touch. Very hard to do. So today we're going to look at the example of Jesus and the woman at the well. There's, again, there's so many lessons we can learn about this encounter, especially around Passover. Jesus brought hope into the world. Redemption. Deliverance. That's what, what that unleavened bread pictures. The deliverance and the redemption and our salvation. Putting sin out, learning to grow, to measure the fullness of Jesus Christ. And accepting that life, learning to live it, learning to give, learning to be a servant, as he saw in the, uh, in the foot washing. So all of that points to salvation, eternal life, and the kingdom of God for us. But after you've been in the church for a while and you've been walking this way, you forget about yourself. And you're, everything you do is for others. You want to do everything, everything you do for others, from a selfless approach to life. That was Jesus. <clears throat> that was his example. And that's why he gave us the woman at the well, to teach us love, to have compassion, mercy, care for them wholeheartedly. So again, at this Passover season, as we examine ourselves and we see how we are doing, how are we doing in this, this area of, of loving our, our brothers and sisters, and those of are lovable are easy to love. Those that aren't so lovable, <laughs> you know, the porcupines out there that are hard to grab, and, and those are those are just as important. 
uh, to become more like Jesus Christ. Those that are hurting, those that are down, those whose life has not been uh, very nice to them, very uh, beneficial, very kind. So look between the lines. Look at the nuances. We're going to learn some things. You know, Jesus, as he lived on this earth, everywhere he went, he interacted with people, of course. But look who he interacted with. Who, where did he gravitate? To the poor, to the outcast, to the outsider, healing lepers, eating with tax collectors, <laughs> speaking to Samaritans. One of the very first thing he did was this this uh, this uh, uh, encounter with the Samaritan woman. Now look at that. She was a Samaritan, and she was a woman. Oh, she had a double whammy on her in that in that society. In Jesus' world, there Samaritans and women. Okay, we see a lot of examples where Christ worked in that area, and there's a reason for that. He was showing us love, how to love, how to be merciful and comforting to the world that uh, a rejected world, a, a down world. Uh, you know, some of some of the people that have the most difficulty, the most trials, the most uh, unkind <laughs> events that happen to them are the ones that seek God more than others. You know, you have the Laodicean attitude. Well, you have also, you have those that are really seeking God and looking for God. And we have a lot of that today. We're going to run into that more and more as time gets more difficult. So this this example is going to be very good for us. You know, he showed also that he had encounters with the religious community. If you want to call it the religious, I think religion is a good word for it. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The Gnostics and all. But he he didn't care what they thought about him. I mean, he came to turn the world upside down. And from a religious standpoint, he did that. So did John the Baptist. He was out in the wilderness. He wasn't at the temple. Christ went in and out of the temple, but he they didn't like the fact that he didn't kneel to them and, and look to them first. He didn't care what they thought. His attitude was toward those who were uh, less fortunate, those who were in pain, those who needed that Savior, that love and, and compassion. We all need that, but uh, those that realize they need it and that are looking for it. <clears throat> it's not the healthy who need a doctor. They don't think they do. <laughs> but the sick, you know, and he says, I have not called uh, the righteous, but the sinner. And, and I'll just read this, Mark 2, 17, right before he talks about uh, he created the Sabbath, uh, talking about the Sabbath day. He says, but when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eating with tax collectors and sinners, and that's just what I was talking about. Okay, so when, so when the, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes saw him eating with tax collectors, they said to the disciples, why is it that he eats and drinks with the tax collectors and sinners? Why is he over there? Why isn't he with us? And after hearing this, Jesus said to them, those who are strong do not need a physician, but those who are sick, I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinner to repentance. Okay, very important point. That's one of one of his purposes in coming. Jesus was came to serve mankind, all the world, but also those that were in his sphere of influence in Judea and in that area. In his life, he showed us how also, as an example, to serve our fellow man as well. So that's that's what this foot washing ceremony at this time of the year why it was so poignant, why it was so important, why it set the stage. And we heard about that last night. We heard about the example of, uh, of the body of Christ being the church, but also uh, Christ's body, his physical flesh, which is the only way we can come to, re to be redeemed or come to salvation. So before the Passover, Jesus reminded his disciples to be a servant, to show concern and love for the less fortunate and those 
you know, that are, um, well, you just take a look at all the people he, he talked to, and not the high and mighty, not to be arrogant and high and mighty in, in your approach. Even those within the church, even those with him at the time, the disciples, and toward the end of his ministry, as he was heading toward the last week up to Jerusalem of his life, he had to break up a fight, didn't he? <clears throat> he had a fight to break up in Matthew 20. Uh, he said, uh, you know, the rulers of the nation exercise our lord uh, an, a lordship over them, uh, and the great ones exercise authority over them. He said, it's not going to be like that with you. You're going to be a servant. And then he goes on to say, whosoever shall be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to, dis to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. And I mean, how, how better, how much more uh, could you be a servant and love one another uh, other than give your life. And he talks about that in, uh, I think it's John 15. Uh, Greater love has no man than this, that he gives his life. Well, our life is time. We don't see people being martyred today, but what Christ wants us to do is give, us, give our time to one another. That's the most important thing. And Christ is going to show us how he did that at the, at the well. This woman at the well... Um, has so many, so many things that we can learn from. We're going to look at all the different, it's also going to help us set the stage of his ministry and what was going on around the area. So he came to serve, but he also came to serve his creation also, didn't he? I mean, he was the creator. So one of the reasons, one of the things that he stands up in the, in the synagogue when he first starts his um, ministry, and he says, is and I, it's found in Isaiah 61 and also in Luke 4 18 starts around 18. I want to read the one in Isaiah 61 and think about this. This is our charge. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then this is your charge. Okay, uh, he says in Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prisons to those who are bound. We're gonna we're gonna go into we're gonna look at these things and we're going to see those in the woman at the well. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord <clears throat> and the day of vengeance of God. And then it stops there in Luke 4. But then it goes on in, in 61. To He stopped reading right there. Then it says, to comfort all who mourn. There's a lot of mourning going on. Then a lot of people need comfort. To appoint to those who mourn in Zion, giving them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy, and that's what he was offering to that woman, the oil of joy for mourning, the mantle of praise for the spirit of heaviness. How many, I mean, have you ever been in that situation? Have you ever felt that way? I mean, sometimes we feel that way now. We have this heaviness. We have this mourning. We have this uh, stress so that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. So let's, let's think about that again. Let's go over that. Preach the gospel to the poor. Bind up the brokenhearted. Do you know anyone like this? Are you this way? To proclaim liberty to the captives. Now, there's more than just being captive, right? And liberty comes in the form of what Christ had to offer to the woman. An opening of the prison to those who are bound. We find ourselves in prison in many different ways. And to comfort, again, all who mourn. This is a very special group, okay? These, this group up here that he just talks about. That's why he came. 
And that's why you find him with the group that he, he was with. Okay? Love, mercy, comfort, special attention, and care. Those were Jesus Christ's traits, his strong points. That's who he was. It's his character, and that's who we are to be. He was with, again, he was with, like, the lepers. You find him with lepers, demon-possessed, <clears throat> tax collectors, Samaritans. We're going to talk about Samaria. So we see the woman at the well situation. We can gain a lot from how Christ handled things, how he fought how I looked at her, what he gave to her, and those are things that we are to follow that lead in understanding how to become, like the foot washing, servants to one another. Doulos, the, the slave of God, as, as Paul said many times. Christ had great insight into people, didn't he? <clears throat> of course, he was God in the flesh. We can have that too because we have God in us. We have the Holy Spirit. Empathy Sympathy. You have to exercise that, and you have to ask for discernment to empathize with someone and to sympathize. He shows how to be, he was, how he was sensitive to certain things. He just didn't bowl on through life. He sat, he listened, he watched the body language, the nuances. And we're going to see some of those in the, in the woman at the well. He was attentive. First of all, he was there, and we'll talk about that. He was attentive, attentive to others. He was insightful, aware of their needs, and listened. Have you ever sat with someone whose eyes were over here and over here, and you're talking to them, and you can't seem to get them to look at you, <laughs> get in this conversation, because they, they're saying they don't want to be there? So he was, he was showing us how we can love and care and comfort, and how we can serve. Have you ever thought of that as, as a servant? Just to sit down and give your time and listen? That's serving. It's Christ led the, in that way. So this is a special situation. <clears throat> These are valuable lessons we can learn. We're going to go through those. A true servant cares for others, no matter the person, it, who, who he is in the society, or what he has, you know, whether he's in a uh, in whatever, whatever the state, the physical state, the emotional state, no matter what. Uh, John tells us, John was the apostle of love. He writes about love a lot. In John, 1 John 4, 19 through 21, he says, and I'll just read this for time's sake, we love him because he loved us first. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For if he does not love his brother whom he has seen, how is he able to love God who he has not seen? And this is the commandment that we have from him, that the one who loves God should also love his brother. In Jesus' day, there was a fight, there was a racial bigotry going on. Um, we have it somewhat today. Uh, it's played up a little bigger than what it really actually is, but we have that as well today. In Jesus' time, it was very obvious. There were the Jew versus the Gentile. Of course, the Jews were extremely self-righteous in their view of others. Um, there was the Jew versus Gentile, the Jew versus the Samaritan. Now, the Samaritan, in their eyes, was worse than a Gentile. Today, these attitudes are still around. They're still here. They're still in the world around us. They're still in the church. We saw that last night, an attitude of division, of selfish ambition, and bitter envy that James talks about and Paul talks about as well. Jesus chastised the Pharisees for their self-righteous attitude toward others. Even though those were hurting, and people in need emotionally, physically, and spiritually. He, again, he came to show all men that all men are loved in the eyes of God. And if we have that Holy Spirit and we're growing to the fullness of the measure of Jesus Christ, of the stature of Jesus Christ, then we're going to have that as well. We, should, we begin showing that. And that's what the Passover pictures, a lot uh, of uh, uh, 
of what's going on in the next couple of weeks we can see here. He demonstrated what we should have, a love and a service attitude toward others. So let's begin reading in the John 4 where we find this example of the woman at the well. We'll start in verse 1, John 4. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptize, baptizing more disciples than John, and then it says in parentheses, although Jesus himself was not baptizing but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. Okay, now I want to show you, if I can, hopefully you'll see this. Um, there we go. I'm going to share my screen with you. I was going to show you where that the two lie. Judea is in the south. Galilee is in the north. Samaria is right in the middle. Okay. Now, it was necessary for him to pass through Samaria. Now, this, this is an interesting comment because most of the Jews in Jesus' day deliberately headed straight or headed around, went around Samaria. They didn't go through Samaria. They, they, in, they purposefully went around and traveled around instead of going through. Again, because they thought Samarit Samaritans were dogs, Goya, unclean, like the Gentiles. And so they wouldn't go through Samaria. So it says that he, he, he went through Samaria, directly through. He came to a city in Samaria called Sychar, near the land that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, verse 6. Jesus, therefore, being weary from the journey, sat there, now get this, by the well, it was about the sixth hour. So it's in the heat of the day. It's at noon. And he's sitting in the sun. And he's sitting there at, the, at the, the fountain at the well, at Jacob's well. Nobody's going to be there. Everybody comes in the cool of the day. But guess what? The hottest part of the day, a woman came out of Samaria to draw water. Now, we can just read right over that. Okay? Read right over that. There's something there for us. A couple odd things here. Let's, let's get a little description here. We can read between the lines and get an idea of who this woman is. She comes to the well at an odd hour. Why? Why is she coming at noon? Was she avoiding someone or someones? She was probably she probably felt like an outsider in her own community, but also now here's a Samaritan man sitting there, and of course, <laughs> it was awkward. She probably was tired of ducking. Uh, you know, I'm going to make some assumptions here. Here, let, before we do this, let me just tell you the things we know. First of all, she's a Samaritan. She's a woman. The, the Jews would not even look at a woman. They wouldn't even talk to their daughter or wife in public. Women were not equal to men in that society. Okay, they they had a, a rough. They have had a rough go of it all through eternity. You know, <laughs> but it's going to change, and it's changing. But anyway, Samaritan, a woman. She's not married. She's living with a man. She has been married, but married four times. And she is asking religious questions to God and God-centered questions. Okay, those are the things we know, and we're going to see that. The things we can assume from that, and, and Terry, my wife, was a, a domestic advocate, a women's advocate, for 15 years. So some of the things I'm going to make assumptions on are pretty, you know, I, we have 15 years of experience plus the mind of God to try kind of draw this out. So I may not be 100% right on this, but um, we're going to be pretty accurate on some of the things. Uh, she had a lot of baggage. So let's go back and, and talk about what she was doing there. She probably felt like an outsider. She's coming at noon, not when the other people come. She's probably tired of ducking the, the condemning stares and the jeers of the self-righteous you know, the ladies uh, who had it better than her and probably talking about her, her neighbors and the men, of course, <clears throat> that are uh, looking to 
profit from and uh, take advantage of, of a relationship with her. She was certainly despised by the town people. Um, I'm sure the majority of decent people, of course, didn't come at this hour. So she felt safe that she would, if she could avoid them at that time. So I'm sure she was feeling the weight of the water jar <laughs> at noonday. She was feeling a lot of weight. That water jar of pictures was symbolic of a lot of weight she was carrying around with her. Uh, she was tired and weary. Her heart was probably calloused and scarred by the rejections of failed marriages for and now a lover that was living with her who probably didn't give her the time of day. You can just imagine the hurtful comments that were uh, from these self-righteous people that would, they would send her away. Something like, you know, well, here, here she comes. Here's, here's, here comes the woman who sleeps around or the, the woman that, you know, that do -do 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 woman. You can imagine. So Jesus said to her in verse 7, Give me some water to drink. Now, there's several things here. <laughs> Let's get our minds thinking around this. Get this mental picture of this, this encounter. Jesus was available to her. He specifically went through Samaria from Judah to Galilee. He didn't have to do that. He showed up for her. Jesus was there where he could serve, give something that he had. What do we have to give? We have the same thing Jesus had, only in a smaller amount. But he had, we'll see what he had to give him. How did he serve her? He was listening. He was paying attention to her, not like the other men in town paid attention to her, but truly paying attention and listening to her out of love, compassion, and concern for this woman who was in the state she was in. <clears throat> Verse 8, for his disciples had gone away into the city so that they might buy provisions. Now, it's interesting. It took all <laughs> Did it take all 12 of them to go in and get the, get the groceries? Or did Christ tell them to go? So he cleared the field. So it was just a one-on-one -on -one encounter. I think that's probably what happened. We're not sure. But this woman was probably wondering what this Jewish man was doing here at the well at this time of day. And I'm sure she was suspicious of his intentions, just as she'd always been. She'd grown to be that way around men. Every other man she saw. <clears throat> so verse 9, Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, and she probably said this kind of, you know, how is it that you, being a Jew, now I don't know that she said it that way, but think about the background. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan, to give you water to drink? For Jews don't associate with this Samaritans. Okay, a couple things. She was sizing Jesus up here, wasn't she? Well, who is this? What is he? Why? He's a Jew. Why is he asking me for water? She was genuinely curious about why he seemed, you know, why he was asking that. He was different. And she was a pretty good judge of, of men's character. This guy was different. All through Jesus' ministry, he, he attracted those that he went, you know, the, the tax collectors, the, the low, low, uh, level in society, the women, you know, the, the hurt, people that were hurt, lepers, the, the sick, he attracted them. He was, a, he was a dynamic personality. It would have been something to be there walking around with him. <clears throat> so it's important to understand why they felt the way they did, why the Samaritan woman felt the way toward Jews and why the Jews felt the way toward Samaritans. And I've gone over this before. We'll just understand the history of Samaria. Israel was split into two groups, north and south. Israel, Judah, under Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And in 721, the Assyrians came, took Israel, the ten tribes north. They took them into captivity. They left some in the area, and they replanted the Assyrians there. Well, those Jews that were there and the Assyrians mixed in marriage. So they were mixed race, 
and they were a mixed religion. They even built a temple, we'll see later, at Mount Gerizim, which wasn't too far from Sychar. And they didn't necessarily believe entirely in the Pentateuch. They had their own. And they had some other things that Jeroboam had left with them when he went up and put together a, a false religion. So the Jews looked at them as, as worse than Gentiles because they were once there, and now they weren't. So, uh, and then again, it, you know, in, six, in 604 and 586, Judah goes into Babylon. Well, 70 years later, well, that was the, under the Persians, the, they took over Babylon. And 70 years later, Nehemiah became friends with the, with the king, and he sent him back. When he came back to the Jerusalem area to rebuild, the Samaritans were there. They, they didn't like it that they were coming back. So they caused trouble. We can read that in Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, so that didn't help things. That was kind of the beginning of a long-lasting hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans. So here's this woman, okay? And she's talking to this Jew. She's a Samaritan. Do you see, the, see the, uh, the rub and the suspicion? Uh, so she says, who are you? Why are you here? He had specifically placed himself in front of this woman, this rejected woman, this probably depressed woman because of her state of life she was in. <clears throat> but to him, she was valuable. He loved her with an agape love. <clears throat> and she was brokenhearted. Again, brokenhearted. He came to proclaim liberty or freedom to the captives. Was, was she captive? An opening of the prisons to those who are bound. Bound. And to comfort all who mourn. We'll see what he gives her to comfort. This is his heart. He wants that heart to be ours as well. And we, by the, the tr trials and the things that happen to us, we are generating, we are developing crisis. We are his workmanship, e Ephesians 2.10. And he's working in us to accomplish that goal. If we just get out of the way and get the pharisaical, self-righteous, big-headed stuff out of the way and submit, yield, and end up, you know, with a contrite spirit and a humble heart, humble attitude, allow him to work with us. Jesus saw the potential in this woman. She was rejected. She was emotionally battered and abused. And boy, we've seen them. And brokenhearted. Because, you know, we'll, we'll, we can talk about this later, about her marriages. Jesus was sensitive to her needs, the trouble she was going through, her emotions that were on the rocks, <clears throat> shattered. So if we are in this bigoted, racist, self-righteous attitude toward people, we're missing the point. If we cause division and arguments and backbiting in the church, we miss the point. We're too busy to stop and listen and care. We miss the point. We miss the lead of the Holy Spirit. If we look at people in the world as less than us, that we are somehow because we're called, we're better than them. We may not say it, but we might think it. What are you thinking? Are we examining ourselves? I, I'm talking to myself, and I'm, am I examining myself? You know, there's a situation in, uh, uh, with Peter, with the circumcision in Galatians 2. Uh, it says when Peter, verse 11, when Peter came to Antioch, he said, I, Paul said, I withstood him to his face because he was to be condemned. He was wrong. He had gone back into and allowed the Pharisees to affect him. He had gone back into what Christ told him in Acts 10 uh, not to do. And Christ was coming to show them again what not to do. For certain ones came from James and was, they were eating with the Gentiles. However, when they came, Peter drew back, and he separated himself from the Gentiles, being afraid of those of the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews joined him. He led them into this, joined them in this hip hypocritical act. 
insomuch as even Barnabas was carried away with his hypocrisy. So you see the stage. You see what the woman was up against, and you see what Christ knew he was up against. But he, could, he had this feeling for her. He knew what she was going through. He could sense that, his insight, his understanding. And she was beginning to see that this guy was different. So in verse 10, <clears throat> Jesus answered and said to her, If you had known the gift of God, now where do we see that, the gift of God? And who it is that said to you, Give me some water to drink. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, boy, that got her attention. Now, the gift of God, Romans 6.33, is eternal life. Wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. He was offering her eternal life, a way out of the mess that she was in, and abundant living, eternal life. He's saying here, look, if you just ask me, you have to do that. You have to ask me. You have to come to me. You have to desire a different life for yourself. <clears throat> ask me, and I'll show you the way. I am the way. I am the truth. And I have life. Life eternal. John 14, 6. He was offering to show her a way out of her pain to, live, to life more abundantly. He was sensitive to her life troubles and her pain. He could feel it. And, of course, he was Christ. But we can feel it, too. We can feel it with people. You can see it in their eyes. You can see it in their demeanor. You can see it in the way they carry themselves. <clears throat> he could relate to the fact that she was despised, rejected, did that sound familiar? He encouraged, he wrote, or he inspired those prophecies to be despised, rejected, a woman of sorrows and suffering emotional pain. Boy, did he relate to that. Jesus saw her, in her, a woman <clears throat> who had been abused by men. Jesus saw in her a woman who had been abused by men who had been an outcast, a social outcast, or at least a degraded member of her society. <laughs> she had both unwanted heritage, an unwanted gender, and probably a social leper. So Christ understood this, and he's drawing close to this brokenhearted individual, poor in spirit. In Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are of a contrite spirit, not a proud spirit, not an arrogant, cocky, you know, selfish person, but a contrite spirit. And that's what trials in, this, in these situations do to a person. They do to us. That's why we have trials. Well, we, have, we have pain. We have hurt in our lives. That's part of it. He says that's what you were called to, so that you can have a contrite spirit, so that Christ can work with you and a purpose for you in life and a, and a goal and an end. And he was offering that to her. He picked up on her distress and her hurt, and he drew close to her. He pulled alongside of her with the offer of the Holy Spirit and living water. She was precious. She had a sincere heart because she begins to start asking questions. So her heart was right. <clears throat> and, and Christ gave her acceptance, something she hadn't seen for a long, long time. Acceptance, respect. By asking for a cup of water, he was showing her acceptance and was saying, I, you know, I don't see you as other people. You know, I'm not, don't put me in that category over here. I'm coming, I'm coming to help and to give and to serve and to love and compassion. I'm coming to help give you something. He says, I'm not like, I don't, your race doesn't matter, your religion, your gender, all your past sins. They can be forgiven. They can be overcome. 
and he showed her acceptance, respect, and a way out of her past. Isn't that what we have to offer people? Isn't that what God gives us? Isn't that what he's done for us and he wants us to do for others? Now, this living water, and we have that as well, is the Holy Spirit. And the word Holy the, the, the Holy Spirit is a word called paraclesis. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, so I learned this a long time ago. Paraclesis. And it means to come alongside when we go through trials. Come alongside someone. To draw alongside them. And that's what Christ was doing in difficult times. To be called to one side. It's another meaning. To pull alongside like a boat does along a dock. And to comfort. That, that word paraclesis is found in 2 Chronicles, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 1 through 4. Uh, 1, and let's see, it's around 3 and 4. So we'll read, I'll read this to you. Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you can have, grace and peace in Christ. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And that word is paraclesis. He sits on a throne of mercy and comfort. Who comforts us in all our tribulation in order that we may be able to comfort those who are in, in, in a trial through the comfort that we have been given by God, that we have in ourselves. So we have this whole this paraclesis, and we're to use it to comfort others as we've been comforted. It says in verse 5, for the degree, for the degree, to the degree that the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so also the comfort, our comfort abounds through Christ. And if we are in distress, Anytime you're in distress, think about this. It is for your comfort and salvation. Now, boy, that doesn't, physically, that doesn't add up. So if you're in distress, that's for your comfort and salvation, which is being worked out by your enduring the same sufferings that we also suffer. And if we are comforted, paraclesis, it is for your comfort and salvation. And our hope is steadfast for you. Verse 7. Knowing that, that as you are partners in suffering, you are also partners in comfort through the Holy Spirit, through the paraclesis, through the living water. Right? That's what he's telling her. Verse 11. The woman, <clears throat> the woman said to her, Sir, you have nothing with which to draw water. And the well is deep. How then do you have this living water? And that was, you know, physical question. You, are you greater? Now here we go. Now she's going to show her Samaritan heritage and the fact that they think that they're okay as well and they're just as good as the Jews. Are you greater than our father Jacob? And they're sitting there at the Jacob's well. Who gave us this well and drank from it and his sons and his cattle? See how she's saying, I'm just as good as you. We're, you know, here we go back to this, this uh, underlying problem. Jesus took it away. He answered and said to her, Every, back on track. He's laser focused, back on track. A lot of times what happens is we have this surface conference conversation, right? And there's some things beneath. There's some core issues. He was getting to the core issue in her. Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. So this, yeah, you're talking about this physical water. This is not what I'm talking about. He says in, in John 6.35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me shall never hunger, and the one who believes in me shall never thirst at any time. That's what he's telling her. Verse 14, but whosoever, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. You see, you're over here, but I'm going to tell you something that lasts 
forever. Rather, the water that I will give him shall it, him shall become a fountain of water within him, springing up into eternal life. That's what God's Holy Spirit, that's what the calling does for us. That's what becoming like God, like Christ, being one with them does. Boy, what a blessing we have. Look at the blessing he was giving her. He, says, he also says in John 7, 37 through 39, then the, Christ talks about this at the, at the feast, the last great day. He says, now on the last great day of the feast, Jesus stood and called out, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Living water. So in verse 15, we'll go on here. It says, The woman said to him, Sir, now this is a, this is a very important co uh, comment she makes here. Sir, give me this water so that I will not thirst nor need to come here to draw water. Okay, here she's back on the physical again. She's saying, Look, I have to come here at noon. I don't really want to do this. Boy, if you've got some kind of water that I, I don't have to keep coming back here, that'd be wonderful. She was not welcome at the well with others, the good people, you know, the good people in, the, in, in Sychar in the morning. She had to come during the heat of the day. She was tired of the drudgery of hauling that water jar back and forth every day in the heat and going back to a probably an unloving and an ungrateful <laughs> predator sponge of a man, you know, I'm assuming here, okay? But I, I've seen enough of these situations after four marriages and now they're living with some, I, I, you can probably pretty good, get a pretty good picture of who this guy was. She thought the water w that lasted forever would be a, you know, a pretty good trick. Now remember later on in Acts 8, Simon Magus was from, he was a Samaritan. He was from Samaria. And he was a sorcerer. And she probably thought that, well, wait a minute, maybe this guy, he's got a trick here. She, she thought it would be a good way out, at least, out of her past and, and a new start for her. So can this man set me free? Remember, liberty, freedom to the captive. Jesus was saying to her, be free. You can change your life. You don't have to continue in the, in the, in the way you were going. Okay. And, and, and John, again, in that same time, in John 8, 34, Jesus answered uh, those around him. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin. Now, this was later, but... He's telling, he probably tells her this. We probably don't get the entire conversation that's going on here at the well. But he's te he told others, and he probably told her, everyone who practices sin is a servant of sin. And the servant does not live in the house forever, but the son lives forever. Therefore, if the son shall set you free, you shall surely be free. And that's what he was trying to do. Romans 6, 16. Romans 6, verse 16. Don't you realize that to whom you yield yourself as servants to obey, what was she yielding herself to? You are servants of the one you obey, whether it is sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. He was offering her that. But now that you have been delivered from sin, and have become servants of God. You have your fruit unto sanctification, the Holy Spirit, and the end results is eternal life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift, remember I said, I have a gift for you, is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. <clears throat> Galatians 5.1, therefore stand fast in the liberty, which, can he make me free? Can he get rid of this? Uh, drudgery, this uh, captivity that I'm in. Galatians 5.1, therefore stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free 
And do not be held again in a yoke of bondage. Boy, was she in bondage. Jesus was saying, you can, free, you can be free from the ball and chain, your shattered life, all these problems that you have. 16, verse 16, back, back in John 4. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come back here. <laughs> Whoa, now things get interesting. Jesus is starting to get at the heart of the matter. He's going in down below the surface into the real hurt and into the core of the pain. You know, the woman answered and said, you know, I don't have a husband. Jesus said, you're, you've spoken truth. Well, in saying, I do not have a husband. Verse 18, for you have had five husbands. And the one you now live with is not your husband, but you're living with him. This you have spoken truly. Jesus was not trying to embarrass her. You know, he wasn't trying to say, oh, you know, I got you now. No, he was drawing alongside. He was empathizing with her. He was feeling. He was sensitive to that situation. You know, we, you know, Terry and I, we've been around that. Terry's been around that forever. And she brings it home and tells me about it. <clears throat> the pain and the loneliness and the lonely nights and the tears and the groanings and the moanings and the wishing that life was better. You know, uh, he saw that. He saw a person who had no hope. No hope. But here she was at the well. And hope springs eternal. Doesn't it? She had no hope. She did not have a husband. She had nothing. She had a water jar. And she could remember the first wedding day, probably. And, uh, you know, it, it, if you can think of those times, they're happy, there's rejoicing, there's uh, family and friends, joy and happiness, a future life, looking forward to that with a husband, kids, you're going to grow old with, with, with this guy. And, and for some reason, we don't know, it didn't work out. These don't work out for her. They weren't working out. Now, I don't think that was all her fault. Uh, we don't we don't get a physical description. We don't get uh, uh, baggage that she brought through through uh, you know the sins of the fathers before generate or whatever. You know we don't know, but you know what? It wasn't her all her fault. The custom back then in divorce, and and I wrote out a big thing on on why God hates divorce, uh, was that if you were going to get a divorce or you wanted a divorce from your wife, you went to the door. And you opened the door and you yelled to the neighbors, I divorce her three times. And you were legally divorced. So that happened the first time. You imagine what happened the first time that her husband did that to her. You know, the feeling that she had, she was embarrassed. She was pushed out. She was homeless. Shattered. Shattered dreams. And then, guess what? Probably she was lucky and got a got into another relationship, probably another wedding, another ceremony, all that went by, and it happened again. Then it happened a third time, and then a fourth time, and then a fifth time. She's living with someone, and she was pretty messed up, damaged goods. She was feeling worthless, no home, no security, no love, no one you can count on, and here comes Jesus. Talking now, not not from an emotional or uh, a romantic statement, uh, feeling. But she was drawn to this man who cared and sensitive and respected, gave her acceptance and get, offered her something. Life, another way out. I mean, a, a way out of this mess. He wasn't trying to embarrass her. He was saying in verse 18, "For you have had five heartbreaking, devastating failures." I know, she said. He says, I understand. I understand. And now you don't even have a husband. You've got nothing. And, G you know, Jesus was listening and watching. Um, he was sensitive to the, the plight that she was in. And he offered her hope. Abundant life. Waters, living waters. The Holy Spirit 
repentance, uh, baptism, laying on of hands, receiving the Holy Spirit, and then living a life of trials and suffering, but of change, going the right direction, the way, the truth, and the life was sitting right in front of her. So she's not dodging the point here. She is saying, she's no longer dodging the point, right? You are correct. My life stinks. She's saying, where is God? Verse 20. Our fathers worshipped in this mount, <clears throat> in this mountain, Mount Gerizim. But you say to me, you say that the place where it is obligatory to worship is in Jerusalem. So we've got this problem here. We've got the mountain, Gerizim, and we've got Jerusalem. She says, I'm, I've, I've checked both out, and I actually, there's not a whole lot to offer me as uh, uh, what, you know, what you're telling me. It's not there. She's showing Jesus that she's seriously looking for God. She has been. She's had this ache, this yearning. <clears throat> Where is he? She says, where's God? She, wants, she wanted out of the mess. She was desperate to change her life, but it was pushed down under the surface. And she was going day by day, you know. So Jesus is pulling alongside her, face to face, heart to heart. Okay? Jesus said in verse 21, woman, believe me. He's, he's going to tell, he's telling her, now he's getting into the intimate details of what's coming up in 70 AD and after. The way he brought his, his, himself and his disciples to the Passover night and the, the sacrifice and the crucifixion and the resurrection. And all that, he's saying, believe me, the hour is coming when you shall neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You do not know what you worship. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and is now, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. With this life-giving water, spirit, and in truth. I am the truth. Listen to me. Obey, listen, do. Follow me. For the Father is indeed seeking those who worship him in this manner. And he knew that, well, what her heart was. 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And we pass over that. That's an important point to this story. And for our lives and for the world. Jesus was coming to establish something new. The Jerusalem Gerizim debate was over, <laughs> would soon be obsolete, and he was ushering in a new era, a new covenant, spirit and truth, spiritual Israel, and she could be part of that. Jesus has shared with her an intimate discussion on how she can change her life, and he's let her in on a new truth. That change is coming to the religious system of the area. And God is not looking for the ritual or the religion of self-righteousness, of division, of debate, of I'm better than you, and looking down on people, envy, jealousy, bitterness, all that goes along with it. He's looking for a heart like hers, like yours, like mine. He is looking for a relationship and a family. And he's telling her she's close. He sees her heart and her desire and to know God and to seek him. And he's probably already started working with her before that. That's why he goes to Samaria. I believe that. I think he knew that she was there, and he went there specifically to see her. That's just my opinion, okay? The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. <laughs> And this is amazing that he, he tells her something. You can tell that there's a connection here because this is the first time that he tells anyone who he is. And he tells a woman. He tells a Samaritan. He tells a broken uh, Well, look at all the words we've used and imagine what she was like. And he, and he has this empathy for her. And he says, he reveals her to her that um, he says to her, 
Jesus said to her, I, I who speak to you am he. He says to her, you're talking to the Messiah, the Christ, the one who everyone is anticipating. I am him. It's me. What does she do? She drops her water jar. It says she leaves her water jar. She leaves all that behind. She forgets why she's even there. She forgets all that. She's so fired up and excited. She runs down the road, and she runs past the disciples that are coming from the grocery shopping. She runs into the, the community, and she grabs her first meal, and she's telling, oh, I'm so excited. I just gave a cup of water to the Messiah, <laughs> to Christ. Hey, you got to come and see. This guy knew everything about me. He knows this, that, and the other, and he went on and on and on. And boy, her excitement, they believed. They began to believe. And so she's getting all these people, and they all go out. And what does he say? What does he say? And the disciples are there. They don't understand what happened. They're probably wondering why he was talking to this Samaritan woman. What was he doing? And what did he say to her to make her run off like that? John 4, 34. They offered him something to eat, because that's why they went in there. And he said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me to finish the work. And, you know, you can say, are we about doing the work? Are we fired up about doing what God has given us, what he puts in front of each and every one of us? Are, do we realize we only have a short period of time as time goes? You may be a young person or you may be healthy or whatever, but you really only have a few years or days or whatever. Whatever he, You know, what are you doing? What are you doing with it? Are you fired up? To finish the work? Do not say that there are four months and then the harvest comes. I say to you, look around you. Now, this was probably the spring of the year, and the, there were two crops there, and there was that, that spring crop was starting to turn white. Lift up your eyes and see the fields. And he wasn't talking about the fields, for they are already white to harvest. They may have been physically, but he was talking about something else. He was talking about work that needed to be done. He was talking about there are other people just like this woman who we need to go to and to talk to and to get, share with them what we have been given and to usher in, prepare and usher in the kingdom of God and uh, the government of God, Isaiah 9, 6, that Christ will bring to this world here on this earth. Do not say that there are four months and then the harvest comes. I say to you, look around. Look up your, lift up your eyes and see the fields, for they are already white to harvest. And the one who reaps receives a reward and gathers fruit unto eternal life, so that the one who is sowing and the one who is reaping may both rejoice together. Whatever the job is you have to do, we're working toward an end, together as one. For this for in this saying is true, that one sows and another reaps. And then verse 38, I sent you to reap that in which, in which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. So he's talking about all the things that are going on. They're all important. And then they came out. They came out, probably while he was saying that, down the road, the villagers, and asked Christ, to come and to teach them. And he was there for two days teaching the Samaritans about the, the kingdom of God. This example, the woman at the well, is a great example for us of how Jesus Christ had compassion and gave comfort to a dis desperate heart, a broken-hearted woman, poor in spirit, captive, we can learn how to show comfort and compassion and love <clears throat> and kindness to those we come into contact with that God puts in front of us. During this Passover season, we focus on the foot washing service and the bread and the wine, serving others with a whole heart and a whole mind, Sit watching Christ and thinking about Christ, examining ourselves, giving our time and our life to serve them. We also see the body of Christ, which is given for our redemption and theirs. And the blood was shed for the remission of sin and theirs. And we, we have this hope 
Again, hope springs eternal, doesn't it? <laughs> think about that when you think about the woman at the well. This hope of eternal life in God's family, and we get to share it with others, God puts in our way. They are thirsty. They are hungry for truth, a way in life. So let's remember them and give selflessly hope to encourage them over, to overcome and to strive, just as we do in this, uh, Galatians 6, 2, bearing one another's burdens, thinking of, our, uh, of our, our friends and our family, striving for the living waters and the life everlasting. And I want to read one last scripture to you. Focus on the future. Revelation 7, 17, and then I'll stop. Verse 13. And one of the elders answered and said to me, These who are clothed with white robes, who are they? Who are they? And where did they come from? Then I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, They are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. We have tribulation too, don't we? They've come out of the great tribulation. And they have washed their robes and have made their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And the one who sits on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall not hunger anymore, nor shall they thirst anymore. Neither shall the sun nor the heat fall upon them. Because the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will, will shepherd them and will lead them to fountains of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes.